I started using a composting toilet um, back in 2005. I built a cabin in Jamaica and uh, it's too boggy to put in a septic system. I did my research on alternatives to flush toilets, incineration toilets, you know, porta potties, chemical toilets. And composting toilets had the best reviews in terms of customer satisfaction. They were the most ecological, they were usually the most affordable. So I honed in on that. And then in my research of all the different types, there was, um, there's Clevis Multra makes a, a really good toilet that's pretty large. That wouldn't, wasn't suitable for me because I didn't have a basement or anything. Um, Nature's Head, I looked at those. And I, 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 I settled on the Sunmar Excel. I thought that was the best one that, in terms of reviews, in terms of functionality. It has a spinning drum technology. So it's got like two chambers of composting that happen. I said, that's, that's a good one. I'm going to try that. And uh, it worked out great. It, it solved my toilet problem. I wasn't, you know, pooping outside or holding it in anymore. So um, that went, you know, for about five years, I was using that toilet until 2010. So then I, I was, I was, I was, I, um, I was volunteering with Engineers Without Borders and we had a particularly uh, challenging community we we're working with in, in Peru in a community called Belen. It's an uh, informal settlement outside the city of Iquitos. Uh, the, the claim to fame of Iquitos is it's the largest city in the world that you can only get to by plane or boat. There are no roads that go there because it's in the middle of the Amazon. And a lot of the folks that were living in this informal settlement, they'd come from villages looking for work. They couldn't afford a place in the city. So people started squatting and living and building homes uh, on, in the flood zone. And so you can see that um, that's, the flooding is pretty dramatic, you know, about half the year. All the houses are built on stilts, either 10 or 20 feet up in the air. So it's, it's an incredible resilience um, that this community has, has been able to foster in the wake of, you know, crazy, you know, climate conditions that they experience. The one pro big problem, they have about 60,000 people that live there. There are no, there are no toilets. Uh, you can't have flush toilets. You can't have pit latrines. They just go underwater. So people have these... Um, open air toilets that are basically four posts stuck in the ground with a tarp around it. You can see them in the middle picture. And they poop into the drainage ditches. And then the kids are playing in the ditches. When the water rises, kids are swimming in the water. Very high, as you can imagine, very high rates of, of like people have sores and disease. Um, there are vultures circling up ahead. It's, it's a very unpleasant toilet situation. And the, the particular issue that we were asked to help with was there was a clinic in this community where there were doctors and nurses coming down from the US and they were pooping in the water because they didn't have any bathrooms. So the idea was, okay, how can we bring a hygienic toilet solution to this particular community? And that was, so my, that was my task with my team. And what I'd said was, you know, why don't we bring a Sunmar down there, see if people like it, um, and then if, if, if people take to the technology, what we could do is we could reverse engineer it and build it using local materials. Because when, when I put together the Sunmar, I'm an engineer, so I you know, looked at all the little pieces. It's not that complicated. It's just a spinning drum inside of a box. I mean, in the, on the website, you know, there, there's some really subtle um, design features that are quite impressive, and, and they, you don't catch them at first. But it's, it's a relatively simple technology. It's elegant, is what it is. So I was like, we could, we could do this. Um, so that's what we ended up doing. And I've done a bunch of projects in Peru. I think there have been six communities we've worked with where we buy local drums. We make the, the toilets out of wood. Um, and a lot of innovations happen when you know, there's basically you have locals that are working with, with the, it's a limited resources, so people get very creative. And um, so that's how I got into the toilet business, basically making toilets through Engineers Without Borders for communities like in Belen that can't have any other kind of toilet. Oh, and just the other pictures, we had, we had to deliver the toilets by boat. Our navigator was that, that uh, he was an eight-year-old kid, and he was really good. We paid him a dollar a day, and he loved it. He was great. Um, and I was working with a, a doctor, a friend of mine of Rummy, who was wearing his scrubs, 
And one of the big dangers in working in these communities is we're delivering the toilets by hand. If we fall in the water, it's kind of like curtains. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, with their, their immune system is much, much stronger than ours. So we just had to be extremely careful um, not to fall into the water. Um, and this is just some a examples. And I saw the, the woodworking studio um, downstairs. And they, they would, they, I mean, they had a lot of really good equipment because they're all used to building with wood. So those are some of the toilets that, that's uh, like a typical toilet that they would, had made for the clinic and then for some of the local families. And they just took a lot of pride in it. So, um, and I mentioned this to, to Sophie that at some point, like we could do a, because the technology is open source. So right now I only teach people in developing countries how to make toilets that look like that. But I could very well teach folks in Vermont how to make toilets that look like that with the same functionality. And we only use off the shelf materials, whether it's here or in developing countries. So if you're in a far flung area, whether you're in the woods or you're in Peru and you need to fix something, nothing's proprietary, nothing's um, so, um, uh, nothing that you need to get from me, I'll put it that way. And they, the toilets, this one weighs about 65 pounds. That one weighs about 100 pounds, but there was a strong guy who would deliver them on his back um, to the different families. The material cost is about $100 in Peru. I would imagine it would be about the same here. Uh, you could pretty much get everything you need from any hardware store. Typically, we would use plywood, um, but in this case, because they had access to uh, dimensional lumber, they would actually mill the, the, uh, the slabs the, with a chainsaw on site. And uh, that would cut down the cost significantly. So it would go down to maybe a like $50 material cost because uh, they were um, able to do really exact cuts with a chainsaw, amazingly. Um, uh, and this is some other installations that we did. Uh, a lot of pit latrines, people, we get, Basically, we get inbound inquiries from uh, communities in Mexico. We worked in Mexico, Nicaragua, uh, Haiti, Peru, and Senegal. And essentially, people send me pictures like this, which is, you know, <laughs> that's, that I'm in the toilet business, so I, I have to expect that. But I'm like, yeah, that's bad. That's a bad situation. <laughs> so I, you know, and then I get in touch with them and, and try to figure out if they're a good partner. Because we can't go to a community unless we have a really solid on the ground partner that's connected with the community, not just a funding partner, somebody who's on the ground who can help prep the community for our arrival, that can help us integrate into the community for however long we're gonna be there. Usually it's like two weeks, maybe three weeks. Help us you know, get the logistics together and then do the follow up after. So that's like a, a, reno, a, a renovated toilet um, or a composting toilet to replace the pit latrine that they had. And that's one of the families in Mexico. And that initial version of the toilet, we called the CRAPPER, which is an acronym uh, for the Compact Rotating Aerobic Pollution Prevention Excreta Reducer. <laughs> and th th that's what happens. You get a bunch of engineers in a room, and you would try, we're not marketing people, but we wanted to come up with something like an acronym. Initially, we called it CRAP. It was the Compact Rotating Aerobic Pooper. But then we said, no one's going to want to buy or use something called CRAP. So we let go of that, we went with crapper. But then we were talking to NGOs, particularly I was talking to the Red Cross, and they were like, we cannot put in a requisition for 100 crappers. It's gonna get in the news. People are gonna say the Red Cross is throwing their money away on crap. So we had to get rid of the name. But I still like the name, um, but I can't use it, except in settings like this where I can tell retroactively. Um, and these are some videos which I, you know, um, if you email me, I can send them to you. I'm not going to play them now, but it it's, it's basically gives you a, a feel for um, the places that we go, which are extremely remote um, and interesting. Um, so what we did about two years ago is um, we don't really do much fundraising. The, the NGOs that we work with pay us to go and, and work with them, like almost like as a consultant. And, um, but they have very limited budgets. A lot of them don't have a budget for uh, a consultant. It, they have a budget for stuff and training. That, that's pretty much it for NGOs, which, which I understand. 
So I was like, okay, so you know, we need to provide uh, training, you know, which we do, and then we have this toilet product. But even still, they, they, um, there's not enough money to, to have us do multiple projects. A lot of times it's a one-off project. So I created a for-profit entity that was a spin-off on the nonprofit. Like usually you have a for-profit that has a spin-off nonprofit. We're the opposite. We did it. We're a nonprofit that did a spin-off for-profit so we can bring in money by selling toilets that look like this to folks that live here so we can subsidize projects in developing countries. That's, that's what we're doing. Um, so a predictable revenue stream um, and um, what the, the three um, big competitors that we have, or the, the biggest players in the market, are Sunmar, Nature's Head, and Separate. And each of them has, have a lot of really good attributes. Sunmar because of the functionality of the spinning drum. Nature's Head because they have the urine diversion, which is a really nice feature. Part of the reason, a, a lot of people who have a Sunmar toilet say they wonder, why don't they do urine diversion? Because it gets really boggy, especially if you have one of the non-electric kind that don't have the heater element underneath to burn off the liquids. Um, and the, part of the reason is because it's coming from Sweden originally, and there is like a, it's kind of a macho thing where the men didn't want to sit down and, and, and have to pee and have it be diverted. That, that was what I heard is the main reason from the design perspective. They're like, no, nah, they don't want it. They don't want it. So, so Sunmar doesn't have that. Uh, Nature's Head does. Um, and it has a, a tines that kind of spin, which works OK, but there are some dead zones. It's not as good as a spinning drum. So you think of like a backyard composter. The best ones are the spinning drum composters, as opposed to the static ones, or ones where you have an agitator. To get everything moving, you really do need that drum, that bio drum. Separat is, uh, really just looks good. Um, it has a, and it has a nice urine diversion feature. It looks like a toilet. It looks like a, like a regular toilet. That's the real big advantage of separate. So, um, but it's static. It's just like pooping in a bucket. It's, it's really like a bucket system with urine diversion. That's what separate is. And they're all, you know, Sunmar's about 1,300. Separate's about 1,100, 1,200. Nature's Head is about 975. Um, so those are the price ranges and the tech. So what we try to do is try to integrate the technologies of of Sunmar, the, the spinning drum, and the nature's head urine diversion to kind of make, couple those technologies and try to, you know, make it look to as toilet-like as we possibly can, at least in, in terms of dimension. So the, the throw, the, the, the length and the width is about the same as like a toilet with a reservoir would take up the exact same space. So if you had a flush toilet, you could take it out and plug this in. Um, and the last one is something that I, I, I've been working on. So I'm on the planning board for J in Jamaica, Vermont. And we have our, our village is having trouble um, getting some of the commercial buildings occupied because when people try to open up like either a bar or a restaurant, they can't have any seating because the septic systems are not in compliance. And so basically it's, it's kind of making the village a dead, a dead zone. And we're trying to do different things to you know, alleviate that. And it's a big problem in southern Vermont with a lot of the villages, sort of rural sprawl, like people are not living in the village areas anymore, they're going further afield. But having, um, and also we've been talking with the Rich Earth Institute, who's doing a lot of work in Brattleboro collecting urine and processing it for fertilizer, to have like waterless urinals. Like you could basically have waterless toilets, which could be a way of getting around some of those problems of the septic laws keeping people from putting in a coffee shop. You don't necessarily have to have a flush toilet to have a coffee shop. So that, these are some of the things we're working on uh, on the village level. Uh, and hopefully we can kind of try to scale that in, you know, in, across the state. Um, this is the separat, just to kind of give you a visual of what those look like. Very elegant design, very attractive. Uh, this is the Nature's Head 960 is actually the cost. Um, I've been using a Nature's Head doing a little of research, R&D. This is, this is how we do research and development at Toilets for People. I bought one. I've been using it for about two and a half months. And the urine diversion works quite well. I actually copied um, 
uh, uh, copied, borrowed, um, was inspired <laughs> by their little, uh, the visual, um, I don't have the pointer, but the, the, it's like a, it blocks you from seeing the, the P until it gets to a, a, a level in the container that you need to sort of be thinking about emptying it. So I copy that. This is our P toilet. It was really designed for women, but it's unisex. There's the little visual block that we integrated there. And we integrated one of them also for the male urinal, just for aesthetics, because you know, that's, that's a big aspect of this work, is making people feel comfortable with using these facilities um, and not getting grossed out. Um, uh, and then there's the five gallon bucket toilet, which works great as well. Um, it's, the only issue with that is, uh, well, integrating urine diversion helps just in, in terms of urine is sterile, generally speaking. So urine can either go right into the ground through a soak pit or can be captured and then diluted and used as fertilizer. But having it go into the bucket along with the solids um, makes it harder to manage. It makes it um, potentially, you know, um, ex exposure is, is, you know, splashing could be an issue. So uh, I do recommend the Human Newer Handbook and Joseph Jenkins. He has a lot of great things to say about, about composting toilets in general. And just to do a little bit of a deep dive into the technology, there's a little, this one's like a toilet for a bird. <laughs> but it's the same functionality as, as this with the spinning drum. So it's, it's got an opening here with a flap door. And this is really the same as Sunmar. Um, their door, when you spin it to the right, the door closes on its own weight and the, the material spins inside. When you spin it to the left, uh, the door stays open and it dumps. So it's super simple design that, like that's one of the elegant features of Sunmar. Like somebody gave some thought to it. Yeah, you could have mechanisms, you could have different ways of emptying the drum, but that's, that's pretty much the best. The only thing that's really hard about that situation is how you hinge it. And they hinged it very loosely with these sort of like, um, like long horns kind of that come out that go into a, a, a hole. Like if you actually hinged it, the hinge would get rusty and then it wouldn't work. I've tried many different things and I, I would return back to their technology even though I didn't understand it. And then eventually I would say, ah, somebody like tried everything in the world and this is the only thing that works. So I really, hats off to Sunmar in terms of that kind of, um, I think it just, uh, they just put the time in and tried everything. But that's basically how it functions, spinning it to the right and to the left. And so the active composting happens in the drum. And when you, when you start out, the drum capacity, at least in mine, is seven and a half gallons, but the operating capacity is about four gallons. Because when it gets more than half full, you want to empty some out. So before you use it, you fill in about, like a gallon and a half of, of wood shavings or coconut coir is a nice product that I've been using uh, and, and, and instead of wood shavings. And it's good because it's a little bit moist when you, when you make them damp. Um, so you add in about a gallon and a half of this. And then after you use it, you just spin the drum. That's one way of doing it one time. And it's going to mix the waste around. The other way you could do it is you could start out with um, you know, maybe a half a gallon of wood shavings or coconut coir. Or you, can, you could even just put some dirt in there because that'll seed the microorganisms um, to get them going. And then after you poop, you just throw in a handful and then spin the drum maybe once every three or four days. It's really just like personal preference. But in either case, you just don't want the next person to see your poop from the last time. That's the goal. Um, and so when that's... When you do d turn it to the right and you dump it into the bin that's under here that I'll show you in a minute, um, that bin's going to fill up. If two people are using it full time, it's going to fill up in about two months, and you're going to need to empty that out. Um, and I'll do that right now to show you that process. So part of, part of all this is to make the, the user experience as, um, as pleasant or sort of like make it, make it a non-issue. We're not going to make it a pleasant. Make it as easy as possible. Um, so like I was saying, spinning the drum, it's, um, 
the way that this is internally is, is basically, so we make our drums out of high density polyethylene plastic, which is a recycled material. The drum is black, everything on the outside is white. Um, it's a six sided drum and it's got flanges, half inch flanges on the front and the back. And, um, and it's all connected with half inch fittings. So very common plumbing materials that I, I usually get galvanized just so it doesn't rust. And that's what's having the drum sit and then you spin it on, on its axis just like that. So you spin it around and then this is just to keep it vertical because you want the drum door to be aligned. So when you're tightening it down, you'll um, see that little, it's hard to see, but there's, when af afterward when people are coming around, you can see how you want it to be uh, set up perfectly in line. I've also, um, I've done some installations in RVs and this is an oversight, I'm an environmental engineer, I'm not like an aeronautical engineer. So something I didn't account for was vibration when I was designing it. And I, I tightened it to the point where I knew it would never come out again by physical force of spinning or somebody even playing with like it. Also, I turned kids loose on it to see what they can break. And nobody was able to break and everything was fine until I put it in an RV uh, with some friends and they said everything came, it came out of alignment and that's because the vibrations will make things unthread. I didn't consider that. So now I put Loctite on the threads for the half inch fitting. So this is part of the, the, the it was my learning process. Um, and, um, oh, so, okay, so that's how you spin it to the right. Um, when you need to dump it, you spin it toward me. But you see there's a, there's a, there's a, a lock. There's a locking mechanism. And that actually also, Sunmar, I, I give, this, give them credit. You have to overcome, you have to hit the flusher in order to spin it toward me. So that makes sure that people don't dump the waste by accident. You know, spin it the wrong way. So again, another really elegant design, it's just like a simple spring mechanism that keeps, um, you see there's that little rod coming out, uh, horizontal, and you see there's like a disc, but it's a little divot on the vertical. And the, so basically when you, when I go like this, that vertical thing comes up and then you can spin it toward me, otherwise you can't do that. So like very elegant design, simple. Um, the sliding door, this is a nature's head innovation. So if you're just sitting down to pee and you don't necessarily want to look at the poop, you don't have to because you have this little sliding door that covers it. And then if you're on the toilet and you say, oh no, I actually do have to poop, then you yeah. open it and, and you could actually put the sliding door on either side. So in the RV situation, they had a hard wall here, I switched it. So, um, and that's the other nice thing about this being an open source technology you can play with it and, and, and modify it uh, however you need to. Um, and the urine diversion kind of comes through. Um, this this has, has, basically this has been like at least 100, maybe 150 versions of this toilet that I've done since 2010. Um, and this is, has, and this one is still evolving, the interface. This is the most important piece of technology, I would say, because this is what people interact with. And this is, the big problem with urine diverting toilets is they, they getting clogged. That's the, the, the issue. So the way that I've solved that problem is I have a hole here. So this is pitched. You pee in this area. It's all sealed. And this fitting um, doesn't get clogged. Basically, it's just a crumb cap. And that keeps, even if you throw like um, coconut coir in here, which I do, which helps with, it's almost acts as like a splash guard. Um, the tubing never gets um, occluded. And then it goes into another tube out here and out into a container, or it can go right into the ground. So the urine management is super critical. And um, the, uh, the other aspect is in terms of, from a urine perspective, not, yeah, please. I encourage people to put toilet paper into a bin because it'll just artificially fill up the drum. Uh, and um, yeah, that's, that's usually what I recommend, yeah. It says on your website that you have to empty out part of the material every two weeks. 
Every two weeks. Mm. Two months. Two months, just two weeks. Mm. So every two weeks we're going to the, oh, the urine, yes, yes, yes. So the, Oh, to the finishing drawer, right. So that's, that's the spinning part. So every two weeks, the, yeah, so good point. Um, every two weeks, that's when you spin it toward me and hit the flusher to go into the bin underneath. And then this is going to fill up every two months. So it comes out in just like a regular busboy bin with a lid. So you carry it away. And this, one of the problems that I have found with the nature's head is that when it gets full, the it's big and it's heavy and it's awkward and you got to take it off the floor. Um, so I tried to make this a lot easier by having a, and there's no cover. So by having a cover, it's safer. Um, I, have the I have it lined with a bag for the, mostly for the RV folks because they aren't able to bury it because they're on the road. And you can throw it away as you would throw away diapers or you know, anything like that. So that's, there's nothing illegal about that. Um, and that's what the, the every two weeks is you need to spin the drum to empty out, empty, to give more space in the drum, and, and this will fill up in two months. So this is sort of where the static composting happens and the dynamic spinning drum composting is in there. Um, and you'll, you'll see um, another thing that I, again, borrowed from Sunmar is uh, there are these they're not really labeled, but these here, these are poop shelves, I call them. And the thing is that the poop, when you, when you spin the drum, it's, most of it's going to fall into the bin, but you don't want any of it getting in, like, in the side and basically on the top of the bin, because then when you take out the bin, it's kind of like it's teetering. And it, you know, so you basically want everything to go into the drum or get funneled. So poop shelves are, are, are a big help in that regard. Um, I think that's everything. On here. I have a question. Yes. Does it work in any climate if it's really cold? Or does that make a difference? Yeah, if it's really cold, if it gets below like 50 degrees, the microbial activity is going to go down really like almost to, to nil. I mean, when it gets to be freezing, it's going to be nil. So it's not going to hurt the unit. Um, it's, just gonna, it's just not going to compost. So at that point, you might be better off just adding in ash on top of the poop just to, to neutralize the odor, to neutralize the pathogens. Because the, the, if you add in ash and, and you're actually trying to compost, then you're, you're going to kill the microbes by, by um, raising the pH too much. But if you're not getting any beneficial of, you know, microbial action, then you may as well just add in ash and then, and then you can neutralize um, the pathogens that way. And then we always recommend when you do take it out and bury it that you, you bury it in a, you get it in the ground. You don't use it for vegetables, no surface crops. Get it in the ground and put ash on top as a, as a, as a disinfectant, basically. You could also use agricultural lime. Basically, what kills pathogens is heat, but that takes energy. You can get it to a certain temp, like a compost pile, you know, if it gets the, you know, if it's really doing its, its thing can get to temperatures that can kill pathogens over a period of time. But that's challenging. Um, you can heat it up, but that takes energy, you know, with like propane or something. Uh, you can raise the pH, because the thing of the pathogens are used to living in your gut, which is acidic. So if you raise the pH, that kills them. And they're like us in that they, 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 they need air and they need moisture. And if you dry them out, that also kills them. So, Basically, from our perspective, we, try to, we dry them out in the finishing drawer. The, the, the drum is going to be moist because that, you know, the, especially if you're using coconut coir, it's going to be moist for all, but when it falls into the, the bin underneath, it should dry out. That'll kill pathogens and then the ash. So you, you, we're hitting it with those two. We're not doing the heat because, again, that takes energy. Yeah, if you have a setup where you can like have some pallets around it and, and dedicate it for you know two years, then come back and use it, that's that's absolutely fine. Usually, I don't lead with that because um, I, you know, it's good to have like folks that are familiar with that would manage that properly. Like the worst thing I would I wouldn't want anybody to get sick or like to tell people to do certain things, but if um, 
they're comfortable with that and they have the space for it, then it's absolutely appropriate. And it's the same in, in developing countries. I never lead with the reuse of the waste because that's a this taboo around that. But if they're farmers, they know about the reuse of excreta for fertilizer and they might raise their hand and say, can I use this on my crops? And I'll say, yes, for your fruit trees, when you're burying the root ball, use it there. And so that, that's generally how um, I present it. That's a good question. Yeah. Um, have you talked to any of the waste facilities about incineration? Um, no. Um, I have been incinerating some of the waste coming out of the nature's head toilet because in the winter, I, the, getting access, to, usually I have a hole on, in, the, in the ground on the property that I bury the waste and cover it with ash, but in the winter, that's challenging. So I have been burning the waste myself in like a covered like fire pit and that works out just fine. I basically just get a real hot fire going, maybe a couple of beers, <laughs> and, then, and then I take out the nature's head and I show, basically once they get a good bed of coals, I shovel it out and then put more wood on top and basically make like a sandwich, a poop fire sandwich. And that works fine, and it's gone. Um, but is it impractical to have them incinerate in the unit? Well, there are incineration toilets that work fine. Um, they're a little pricey. You do have to pay for the propane when you fire. But that, that's one of the technologies I thought about back in 2005. But it just felt weird. Uh, it felt unnecessarily technological, and uh, I just decided not to, but it's a, it's a viable option, absolutely. You know, I have a friend that's trying to order one, and it comes from Norway, but it's like 6,000 bucks. One yeah, one. yeah. There are... She refers to it as a toaster. Sorry? She refers to it as a, a toaster. toaster? Yeah, it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of like a toaster. A lot of the really advanced toilet technologies do come out of Scandinavia. And part of the reason is because of the, the problem there is the, the permafrost. Um, you can't have a septic system if your ground is frozen. So they've been really ahead of the curve, sort of like how the Japanese have like the best flush toilets. The Scandinavians have really nailed technologies around alternatives to flush toilets. And that's where the Sunmar you know, originated. They moved to Canada, and that's where they, they do their work now. But uh, part of what uh, what we're trying to do with Toilets for People is like, so this is a technology that was created in Scandinavia for a completely different situation, but it has so much applicability in the developing world where it's warm, where basically flood prone areas in the developing world. So it was created in one area for permafrost to deal with that problem. We have a totally different problem, but the same technology could work great. So that's, we're, try, we're not trying to reinvent the toilet. We're taking an existing toilet technology that's been proven since the 70s and we're trying to bring it, we're trying to make it open source for people here, and then we're also trying to bring it to developing countries so people can make it locally using materials they have and skills that they already have. Um, that was a question, yeah. Do you, do you need to maintain a, uh, a certain level of activity? So, say you put this in a cabin, yeah. which is occupied on an occasional basis. Fine. It's actually better, because if you, because the, one of the critical ingredients to uh, this whole system, I, there's, there's plastic, there's metal fittings, there's agitation, there's coconut coir, there's, there's all these things, there's the, the poop that goes into it. Something that people don't really consider a lot is time. Time is a critical ingredient to composting toilets. If you don't give it time to do its thing, the composting won't work. So some people say, oh, this is a great toilet, I want to install this at my construction site where there's going to be 100 guys. I say, no, can't work because there's no time. You're not giving the toilet time to process the waste. You're just going to fill it up and then you're not going to, then that's it, game over. So in that situation, it's better to give it more time. And so, yeah, you can leave it alone. Two questions. The first one, talking about time, you have to wait between the last time you turn the drum to the right and the time you can take the tray out so you don't have some of the fresh stuff down there. Yeah, that's what we recommend. So good point with time. Uh, so what, basically every time you spin it, about a gallon or a gallon and a half of waste will fall out of the drum because the whole, that, the, the door, the flap door is only part of the drum. It's not, so not everything that's in the drum is going to fall out, only, only part of it. So 
you know, if you have four gallons in there, maybe a gallon will fall out. So that's going to go into the bin. It's going to sit there for two weeks until you spin the drum again. Then another gallon is going to fall in. So that's fresher. And then when you spin it, it, the capacity of the bin is five gallons. So let's say you spin it four times and you wait that last time, two weeks before you're going to spin it again and then it, it, you know, it's going to be at capacity, take out the bin, empty it, put it back in, and then dump it. And that's how you do that process. So you never have anything fresh. Everything's either two weeks old, four weeks old, six weeks old, or eight weeks old. And my second question is, do you need to clean the drum at some point? Never. Although in developing countries, because they, we didn't, do a, a good enough job, honestly, like in terms of training, to be clear about what to clean and what not to clean. There was one of, one of the, the ladies who used the toilet longer than anybody. We came and visited her. We did a follow-up. And she's like, yeah, I take great care of the toilet. I clean out the drum every, every, every couple of months. And I was like, don't do that. I mean, it's, it's not necessary. It could be potential ex exposure to pathogens. And you want to have microbes in the drum. You don't want it sterile. So we had to tell her, look, it's not going to help clean the other stuff, keep it tidy, but never clean the drum. Even though you can take it out and you can fix it if something goes wrong, just like you could take out the interface, never do that. So is composting actually happening in the drum or in the bin? It's not just turds covered in sawdust. Like it's breaking down and so like taking up less space? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, basically, that's, that's what you're leveraging in terms of why it's, it's, um, you only need to empty it out once every two months. If you didn't have the, the composting process, is going to reduce the volume by upwards of 80%. There's also a lot of desiccation happening. So like 90% of your poop is, is liquid, is water. So a lot of the liquids are evaporating off. And you're giving it time for the liquids to evaporate off. And there's a, there's a fan, there's a little computer fan in the back that's wicking out air um, that you could run using a, like a small battery and a solar panel. The amperage is about 0.06 amps, so it's a, it's a tiny draw. Uh, but that's going to help you desiccate the waste, dry it out, and it's also going to introduce air so you can help that composting process. Because the microbes, they want to breathe air, they want a little bit of moisture, and they want food. So the poop and the sawdust, it's, you know, there's the food. Yeah, so basically it, it's not just um, poop covered in sawdust, but as getting to the question before where the ash, if you were to put ash in, then that would be ash covering poop. And that would fill up in like, I'd say about six weeks, more like a month. So you'd have to empty it out monthly as opposed to every two months. So the composting process is helping the maintenance be easier. That's really the, the big advantage of it. It's reducing the volume. It's optional. I've, I have one uh, person who, who I just recently installed a, a toilet in Newfane, and he's like, I haven't even hooked up the fan, and I don't, you don't really need it. Um, it's, uh, you'll, if, you're, if it's inside a structure, like a cabin, you'll notice the smell. It'll be like a little bit musty, but if it's not offensive to you, then you don't really need the fan. If it's in an outbuilding, then you definitely don't need the fan. And in all the applications in developing countries, we never use a fan because they don't have electricity. Um, but if it's so we usually build their toilets on, a, on an exterior wall and use that as, as a fourth wall and then build the toilet around it. So it's, and people aren't accustomed to having a toilet in their house. They also don't want to go to a pit latrine that's like 100 yards away. So this is a way of bridging that gap. But you, it, if it's outside the roof line, then you definitely don't need a fan. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, there are definitely going to be pathogens in it. it, it, it the, the, basically, what comes out of the Sunmar and what comes out of our toilets, is, it does look like a mulch. And it looks, it's not odorous. It does look relatively safe, but it's not. Pathogens can persist for like up to two years, especially a, 
ascaris or roundworms. So you definitely don't want to handle it with, with your hands. Uh, you definitely don't want to put it in a place where like a dog can get into it and then go and lick somebody's face or, or kids are playing. Like basically, it's really the safest thing is to get it in the ground if you can, if you can do that. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, when you don't have moisture there, and especially if it's warm, that's, I find that's when I get bugs. I get there's like fleas. Sure. The bugs from it. Yeah. Well, one of the things about the Sun Mars fan, it's wildly oversized and totally inappropriate. All you need is a small computer fan. So that's something where they over-engineered the bejesus out of it, and they just, it's just, it's just a mistake, honestly. Because that was the first thing that failed on my unit, and to get in there and to change it out is a big hassle. And it is, it's too powerful. Uh, so, and you'll notice for the, for the non-electric version, they just have a computer fan. And it, it's curious, why don't they just do that for the other version, but they didn't. Uh, so I think, that was, I, I think that was a design flaw for some of the reasons you're saying, it dries it out too much and it takes too much energy. Well, they, they are, but the heating bin will basically dry out the drum above it, and then, then when you have the super strong vacuum sucking air, then that, that's what leads to um, it drying out the waste unnecessarily. So your, all, all the uh, timelines you're giving are based on the use of two people, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, there we, we use 15-gallon uh, drums, stock drums. Those are the second most common drum. Five-gallon buckets are the most common thing you'll find in developing countries. Pretty much everybody has 15-gallon drums for water. So we use those, and so that doubles the capacity. So you can get larger families using it. Um, but we would, I, I cap it at, 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 say, like a family of six. And then if they have a bigger family or extended family, then I, I'll say get two. One for the girls, one for the boys, and you know. So there's ways of, of doing it that way. And then for schools, what we found is a lot of times the kids just need a place to pee. A lot of and and so to when you're dealing with a high volume of people, what we'll do is we'll install like urinal blocks. So the urinals, um, basically, we did like a knockoff on this urinal by just taking another very common item, just. And then had, taking a water bottle and a piece of metal as a flange and, and into a garden hose, and then that goes right into the ground. So you will have kids queuing up. Like in Haiti, that was a big issue because 100 kids in the school. And they only had a budget for building so many toilets. But building these, this takes like a, a dollar, maybe two dollars. So we had a whole bunch of these set up. And a lot of times, that's all they needed to do. They wait till they get home to poop. Uh, and then the pee toilets, the same for girls. We'll make the exterior out of wood and with a funnel and a and the tube going to the ground, and that takes care of a lot of the um, usage. Uh, yeah. Disposal of the urine, I discussed this. Uh -huh. what's the pro what's your plan? Urine is generally speaking sterile. A lot of people say it's not sterile. Like if, if somebody has a bladder infection, then it's not sterile. But generally speaking, it's like as sterile as tap water. Like it's really not pathogenic. Like feces is, is super pathogenic. Urine is not. So urine, it's safe to just dig a hole, fill it with rocks, and send your uh, hose in there as a soak pit. Essentially, that's what, we, that's what I recommend doing. Or, or if you take the bottles and you go somewhere, you can dispose of it. Yeah, if, if, if you were dealing, if you were worried about somebody doing an inspection on your bathroom, you can have the, the bottle set up and say, look, I contain it, and then I take it to my neighbor's house and we pour it down the toilet, okay. But, if in the dead of night you sneak in there and you take the bottle and you pour it in the ground, it's, you're not hurting anybody, it's fine. It, it's, you know, nobody's catching you and it's okay. If you have 30 acres of woodland, you can just pour it in the woods. If you have, if you live in an apartment building and you carry it downstairs and pour it on the ground, it, it doesn't matter. You don't need any space. It doesn't take anything, really. That's, that's my recommendation. Yeah. What happens to the urine in the system that's diverted and like emptying it and it's sitting and because usually urine smells once it starts to sit. Sure. 
The, so there's a, a container in the back. It's a two and a half gallon container, the same as the one for the male urinal. Um, and that's gonna fill up in about a week or so with two people using it, if you're peeing like a half a liter a day or something like that. One way of, of, of mitigating the odors is to add about a half a cup of vinegar in at the beginning. The vinegar is gonna stop the process by which um, urea is formed, which is the, the smelly part. And so basically, yeah, so if you put in vinegar first, that's gonna neutralize the odor by making it so that it, it, it it won't create that odor-making compound. It's the degradation of the urine that makes it smell, and you're arresting that by adding in vinegar. You can also add in this blue seal stuff. It costs about 20 bucks. Uh, it's very effective. It lasts for maybe six months or so. It basically it rides on top of the urine, creating, creating a seal so that they can't, it can't off-gas. So it's a different way of addressing it. Instead of keeping it from forming, it creates a barrier against it. Going back to the toilets that you were building in, in Peru, or that you built and brought to Peru, um, how you said that there was nowhere for them to put their, their poop. So where, how mm. were, where were they disposing the Good, good question. So yeah, so this is, um, and th this, this was like a, a study of, um, the usage in Peru and what we did is so like this is like a typical house and people can see it later on we kind of have an informal session is when we would install the bathroom we would we would make sure that they had a a, a strong enough platform that we would put a 55 gallon drum for them to store the waste during the rainy season when the um, when the water basically the waters will come up so you can't see any ground at all but half the year you can see the ground. So basically what we do is have them dump that 55 gallon drum of waste onto the ground and then dig a hole next to it, push it in and then cover it with ash. And essentially in this case, the whole place is wildly contaminated. So it, it's, uh, we weren't concerned about trucking it far away. It's actually better that we keep it there because everything is, is, is impacted anyway. But that was our solution. And basically with a 55 gallon drum, that would hold enough for the family until the waters receded. Okay, Let's see if I have any other. So free delivery anywhere in the USA, it's 895, 825 if you pick it up in Jamaica, that's where our shop is, that's where we make all the toilets. Five year warranty on parts. Next steps for TFP. Um, so selling to tiny houses, off grid homes, RVs. Um, we're starting to exhibit a lot more farmers markets, trying to grow the, the company locally in Vermont um, and, um, and doing more compost and training workshops in Haiti and Peru. That, those are the main places that we work. Um, and that's it. Um, so I can entertain some more questions. We still have 10 minutes left. I can, I can also do a little more technology briefing if there's anything that I missed. Um, ah, okay, here's something people can pass around. This is, so this, this is all high density polyethylene plastic. It's milk cartons, number two plastic. We get this, they, they it's, so, it's, so it's closing the loop on the recycling. The, Cartons get melted down. HDPE has a very low melting point, so it's actually very easy to recycle it. it you melt it down, you, you, they put it into these molds that make sheets, and we buy the sheets and then we cut them either by hand or with a CNC machine. And this is, uh, this is an example of it. So we make them in white, we make them in black, and then we're making them in dolphin gray, which is the next. So you can sort of see the texture of it. It's, it's impermeable, it's marine grade plastic. So uh, it's easy to clean, and that's not going to show the, the dirt as much. This, I, owe, I attribute this technology to the Rich Earth Institute in Brattleboro. Basically, for the urinal, the, the ping pong ball will cover the hole in the urinal. And then, if you're standing up and peeing, it's a way of gamifying the peeing process. Because you, if you are just right hitting the ping pong ball right off the top, like a, you get a top spin. And if you have any kind of a logo on the ping pong ball, you can see it. 
So that gamifies it, that's great. But also once you're done, it settles back into the hole so it blocks the air. So it's kind of like that blue seal stuff in terms of blocking the place where it goes in. And then it's the same with the, with the pee toilet, the unisex toilet for ladies or, or for men too, because you could basically pee the same here and here. But it's the same principle. So the ping pong ball, it kind of takes the place of the, the little, um, you don't have to get those uh, mints, I guess you call them. <laughs> I don't know what you call them. But you don't have to get, constantly get those. Those could break down and they get a little ornery. And then you have the other ones that are sort of like, guys will know this, like the, the, urine, the uh, little prongy plastic things that are sitting in the urinals that people throw gum into. Mystifies me. <laughs> I mean, I mean it like, it's just such a bad practice that men do that. Some men, don't, don't do that. But, but basically that's what that thing is there to catch people from throwing gum in, which you shouldn't be throwing gum in the toilet anyway. But anyway, so that, uh, you don't need the, either of those items. You just need the ping pong ball. Um, and, sorry? Is that a duct? Yes, this is a, uh, this duct is for um, venting the, the Basically, the computer fan is about three inches in diameter, and it mounts on the inside of the unit. And then this takes it through the wall outside. And you could just direct vent it if it's not in a high traffic area. If it's in a high traffic area, I would take it up and just 90 it at like you know six or seven feet, just so that the odors kind of waft, waft away. Um, but that's that's what that is. It's vented outside, yes. Unless, unless, you know, the basically, like I was saying, the odor is, is not, the thing that makes poop smell is that it's wet and it's going anaerobic and then you're getting hydrogen sulfide. So basically, if you keep it dry, relatively dry, then the aerobic de decomposition doesn't create the odors. But you still smell it like you'll smell like, like, like musty, like, like dirt. It'll smell kind of like dirt, kind of musty. Some people have no problem with it, other people, they prefer to vent it. So yeah. Of not separating the urine and the. Yeah, but if you just kept that, you saw this kind of like an outhouse, sort of, but you're taking it out of bucket at a time. Um, what do you mean? Not separate. Well, the only the problem with not separating the the urine is that your waste is gonna get potentially it's gonna go anaerobic. It's gonna start to break down under conditions where there's not enough oxygen. So the anaerobic microbes are gonna take over, and those are the ones that make the stinky sewer smell, not the aerobic ones. The aerobic ones are the ones we want for the, for the composting. There was a question in there. That's actually a great idea. One of the situations that we have in Haiti is exactly that, that they dug a pit super deep. Sometimes they dig them so deep that they intersect the water table, which creates a whole new problem. This one was super deep, but the water was so much deeper that it didn't matter. But what happened was that there was wasp nests in the pit latrine and bees and all kinds of, it was just, it was, uh, it was like those pictures before, I, wanna, I just want to like traumatize you guys again with those pictures. So it was like that, but with wasps coming out. <laughs> and, I was, and I was like, okay, this is, yeah, I could see why the kids are terrified to go to the bathroom. I wouldn't want to go either. So they either hold it in or they don't drink water and then they can't focus. So what I, I covered it with a box and then I built the composting toilet next to it in that dead space. But then he was saying like, you know, the maintenance is getting a little hard with 100 kids, even with the urinals. They have to empty it out, you know, fairly frequently. I was like, just dump it in the pit. You know, because it's not where, where I, I like the idea, theoretically, of reusing it beneficially, but we are not in the, in, we're in the business of like toilet, the reason why we call ourselves Toilets for People was because we want to get toilets that are hygienic and easy to use for people. We don't necessarily want to make compost. We're not in that business. Um, because if it's easier for them just to put it in the hole and it's, it's not going to impact anybody. 
other than you know, you might, the guy might see a wasp when he's dumping it in, but that's just for like a second. Um, that's actually a really good way of repurposing existing infrastructure that's already there beneficially to make it easier on them. Because you know, these folks in, in this village in Haiti, they have a lot of stuff going on that they need to give attention to. And dealing with the toilet should be as quick and easy as possible and safe. So that's, that's what we've been recommending they do in that case. Uh, the bin, well, it, 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 in terms of this, this, if you could see the size, it's a little bit bulkier in this one. Um, you don't want to make it so big that you can't carry it easily. Like, you don't want it any more than like seven gallons or eight gallons of waste. Otherwise, it gets to be bulky, and then you can have a trip and fall hazard. Um, and you also don't want to make it, yeah, you don't want to make it so big that, yeah, you, it, it's just, it's harder to handle. The, the, basically, the go-to technology in developing countries for composting toilets is the dual pit above ground vault latrine, which is basically like an above ground pit latrine. It's basically a brick, you can think of it as a brick shit house, like four feet square, high, four feet high, two of them side by side, you poop and into one until it fills up, then you move to the other one, you poop into that one, and then theoretically you go back to the first one, empty that out and reuse it as fertilizer. Nobody wants to do that. It's nasty stuff. It's not fertilizer when you open that door. It's like garbage, dead chickens. It's just like, what people do is they abandon them. So part of what we're trying to do is say, OK, don't make the maintenance so infrequent that people never do it. And then when it comes time to do it, they're horrified. And then they just want to, they just rip down the superstructure and then build a chicken coop with it. And that's the end of the toilet project. You know, That's really what happens most of the time. There was a question. Can you talk about permitting um, regulations in Vermont? If you're burying the waste. Vermont does, Vermont is very forward thinking in that they actually do have a regulation on the books that says if you bury it, as long as you bury the waste in a place that would be appropriate for a leach field, which means it's 100 feet, not within 100 feet of a wellhead and down gradient, then you can bury it there. Because essentially it's kind of like you're doing a little leach field. There's no difference, except the leach field is, is like wildly contaminating, like septic systems are just groundwater pollution machines. but there are certain places where you can put a leach field. And they said, well, if you could do this aggressively polluting thing in that kind of a spot, then why couldn't you just dig a hole and bury the waste? And so they said, that's OK. So from a regulatory perspective, if somebody were to come to you and say, so where do you bury your waste? You would say, oh, in that place that, that's leach field approved, kind of. That, that would be where you, you would, if you don't have that, maybe find a friend or just throw it away. I mean, it's not ideal. But if you're in a situation where you, you don't have a toilet and you need something and you need to get rid of the waste, taking it and throwing it away like you would throw away diapers is, is legal. There's nothing legal about that. Um, huh? Seems wrong. It seems wrong, but it's legal. I mean, I mean yeah, there's, yeah, agreed, agreed. And the urine that we already talked about, I, I, there's no regulation. I would, I would imagine pouring the urine in that same leach field spot is OK as well or finding a friend with a flush toilet and then pouring it in their drain. But okay. pouring it in the ground, yeah. I did call the state and I asked oh. them. I actually referred to the Muslim Basin because we need to get some questions about this. Oh, oh, sorry. I called the state and I talked to them. I got the picture many times. Every time they talked to me about it. And we basically said, we're going to do that. They do have some regulations that basically town by town, you have to check in and see what your permitting is. But you're not supposed to be using whatever you're doing. Like if you're com making compost or if you're just like pooping in a bucket, they want you to bury it. Yeah. yeah and, and it's basically like depends on the regulations, the permitting that you, they want you to get a permit. So there is that. Like, so if you do want to go about it legally, then you can, you can find out about permits. But yeah. you might also get like, no. Yeah, there's a process. That's why the, the, the radar, whether you want to be on the radar or not. The other thing is, you know, like outhouses. There are lots of outhouses still people are using in Vermont. And those are deeper holes that probably could potentially have more potential of intersecting the water table. So like in terms of regulators focusing their energies, I'd imagine they'd focus on those first before they start focusing on people who are composting their waste and then burying it in a shallow hole with ash as opposed to having a completely uncontrolled pit that 
could be any variable amount of you know depth. Um, so you know it's sort of like not not being the worst kid on the block and trying to work with the regulations. How does this technology compare to the Clivus system? Yeah, the Clivus system also uh, from Scandinavia. It was bought by the uh, Rockefeller. Um, I forgot her first name. But she really wanted one. They weren't importing them into the US, so she just bought the company and moved it here and got one. Um, <laughs> and uh, so th she's been running that company since then. And basically what that is, is it's, it's, it's kind of like a pit latrine in, in that it's a, it's a big a vessel that sits usually in the basement area. And then when it falls, it kind of tumbles down a, a, a ramp. And as it's tumbling, it's decomposing. And by the time it gets to the end, it's like, kind of like a, a compost. So it's using this, this, but you need a lot of space. They're kind of pricey. Um, and then at the end, there's a little bin that you can take the stuff out. So that's what, clear. it's a good product. It's a, it's, a, it's a good product, especially for like public toilets. But they do make a family scale one. But you can get them enormous ones. And usually if you see some, a, a, you know, a, a park or something, a lot of times they'll have a clevis. Okay, I think we'll have time for one more question. My question was, uh, how would you scale it up Ah, um, I wouldn't. Uh, and the reason for that is because communal toilets get trashed. And I just think private toilets are better. And I make that argument for myself and like an, a family in Vermont. Like it's, you'd want, you want your own toilet as opposed to using a communal toilet. Uh, but then also in developing countries, a lot of times the default is public toilets and they just they typically fail because it's the same like imagine you have a mobile station where no one's doing maintenance on the toilet. It's just going to be a nightmare. You know, it, it's, it's, it's almost by definition going to fail. And that's what happens a lot. And trying to change people's mentality, like, or also like we're trying to work in like refugee camps where there's like a pit latrine toilet block for communal use. And those always get trashed. They're also very dangerous areas of the camp. And there's all kinds of issues that go on with that. But we're trying to change the mentality, say, why wouldn't you have family scale toilets like this, a version of this, in a tent for each family? So they don't have to go, especially if they're sick, they have trouble getting around, they can have their own toilet. Like, why do you have to, like, it's not, that, yeah, so it's, philosophically, I, I like private toilets as opposed to public toilets. And I think, uh, I think that's it, but thank you, everybody, for. Okay.